We gather as God's beloved children. However glad we are, however out of sorts we are, we come together as a people whom Jesus calls into community. So this becomes a place where all are welcome. We have come to give thanks, to pray and sing, to be with others. Let us worship God. Let us join together and worship in the reading of the responsive sentences. In the darkest valley, at the banquet table, in the hard work of life, in our day-to-day -day reality, for worship, for listening, for paying attention, goodness and mercy follow us, our cup overflows. Let us continue by praying together the invocation followed by the Lord's Prayer. Loving God, sweep through our world, ushering in change. May your goodness be shared more justly, so all may share in the blessing of your creation. Bring a renewal in our praying, our thinking, and our living, that we may act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you all the days of our lives through jesus christ who taught us to pray saying our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, church. It's good to see everybody this morning. A warm welcome to our visitors as well as our members, whether you are sitting here in our sanctuary this morning or whether you are watching the video from home. The very heart of our church is summed up in these words. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. We ask that you please be sure that you signed the contact tracing attendance sheet upon entering and gave us your phone number. With the rising threat of COVID and the Delta variant, our, our trustees voted to reinstate our mask requirement uh, for those entering into our sanctuary in our building uh, for the time being. A reminder that today's fellowship time will actually be out front uh, on the front steps in the portico. It looks like the sun's coming out, so we may ha not have to contend with the rain and we can stand outside and greet one another outside. Do you have flowers in your garden that we can use for altar flowers? If so, please call the church office to pick a date and to share them with us. I have something very special to announce. Uh, over the weekend, our very own Marty Kramer turned 94 years old. Marty. <laughs> Happy birthday, Marty. You are dearly beloved in this congregation. We're so glad that you're here this morning. Hope it was a great birthday. Uh, today's altar flowers uh, are provided by Christy Wepler. They were the altar flowers for the memorial service for Ryan Keese on Friday uh, here in our sanctuary as we used it to live stream the service, which was held next door at the Church of Our Savior Lutheran. Uh, Jimmy told me that there were over 500 people uh, who were here in our sanctuary and then also in the overflow downstairs in the parish hall. And we are so thankful that our church was able to provide that space and to be a support uh, for our community. I also want to say a big thank you for our own church members who served as ushers, uh, Regina Rule, Tracy and Mark Vickland, Mike and Beth Miller, Kristen and Mike Ryan, Marie and Red Horowitz, and Melissa Marivelle. So thank you to all of you who uh, helped make the day um, special. Our children and our youth are asked to remain in the service uh, today, and our activities for our children and youth and our Sunday school program will resume uh, in September. For our prayers today, uh, we want to remember the family of Barbara Saunders, uh, the mother of Leslie Huglin, she died recently. George Huntington, uh, who has been in ICU for several weeks and needs our prayers. Uh, good news, Jocelyn Gardner, who is the sister of Lois Stover and the aunt of Leanne Fenimore, is doing much better. Yes, Lois, we're so happy to hear that, and uh, we will continue to pray for healing. The family of Ryan Keese and the family of Michael and James Farrell, uh, our hearts are still breaking for these families who lost their loved ones in the car accident in Quag. And also Brianna Maglio. Uh, Brianna, the girlfriend of Ryan Keese, is the only survivor of the auto accident, uh, and she is still in critical condition uh, and still needs our prayers. So we will continue to pray for her. And now at this time, I would like to invite you, if you're able, to please stand and greet those around you. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 24 through 28. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on a rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew against that house, and it fell with a crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. In the reading of these words, may we hear the word of the Lord. Amen. If you'll please take your order of worship, and we will join together as we read our call to prayer. Bring your worries and your burdens to God.
Bring your blessings and praise to God. Bring your whole life to God, the sadness and the bliss, the pain and the pleasure. Gathered in this sacred space, let us pray to God. God of love, we pause to give thanks for the many gifts of life that are ours, gifts that we find expressed and enhanced in this very community of faith. We are grateful for opportunities to learn and grow in our spiritual lives. We give thanks for the insights and the beauty that we find all around us in our natural world and through one another. Oh God, we are grateful for ministry and for all the forms that it takes in this community, in teaching and in preaching, in care for our children, care for our seniors, care for our building, in leadership tasks, large and small. Oh God, we give you thanks for all of these. Oh God, we pray for the condition of our world today, where there is so much hurt in every corner. Oh God, we pray that where there is violence, we would find a peaceful solution. Where there is hunger and thirst, we would find resources to quench and to satisfy. Oh God, we pray for all of those suffering due to COVID, that you would be with those. Help us to realize and sense our very connectedness to all of humanity. We pray today, oh God, for those in our church family we ask that you would comfort the family of Barbara Saunders, that you would be with George Huntington and Brianna Maglio. Oh God, might they sense your peace and your deep comfort as they make strides in healing. Oh God, we ask that you would be very near presence to the Keese and Farrell families. Might they sense your comfort and your presence, oh God, in these difficult days. Hold them close. We seek to be faithful as we live out our lives, O oh God. Draw us closer to you and to one another. Through Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Well, this is a total gut job. I hear this phrase often while consuming hours of House Hunters or any HGTV show for that matter. It's fascinating to watch people size up a property within seconds. A couple pulls into the driveway of a potential home and says, wow, it has great curbside appeal. And for those of you who are non-well-versed in house hunting, curb appeal means the house is pretty from the outside. Walking up the drive, folks check around the foundation to take notice of any cracks or crumbles in the main structure. Foundation seems in good shape, so far they say, but it's the anticipated reveal of the inside of the house that is most entertaining to we HGTV addicts. Within moments of entering a home, buyers point out obvious and sometimes not so obvious to me problems. This kitchen is at least 15 years old. Everything must go. Butcher block countertops? That is so 1985. Granite, please. Every appliance in here is a different color. We need all stainless steel or this is a total deal breaker. Carpet in the main bedroom, gross. All of this has to be ripped out immediately, people will say. And then there are the repairs and the upgrades that affect the integrity of the whole house. Faulty wiring that is in need of an upgrade to prevent electrical fires. Cracks in the walls revealing larger underlying structural issues water spots and crumbling ceiling tiles indicating leaks and probable unseen rot, mold and asbestos secretly living behind beautifully renovated walls and floors. These issues, once revealed, often make or break the cell of a home. And it is in these often small, sometimes deeply hidden problems that cause the most damage and eventually lead to a home's destruction. In our story today, Jesus calls us to examine our own foundations of faith and life. The story of the wise and foolish builder is nestled at the conclusion of Jesus' famous Sermon on the Mount. The familiar story is grouped in with other practical aspects of faith as Jesus shares the tale of the two builders. Hear now once again this story of firm foundations as told in Eugene Peterson's version called The Message. These words I speak to you are not incidental additions to your life, homeowner improvements to your standard of living. They are foundational words, words to build a life on. If you work these words into your life, you are like a smart carpenter who built his house on solid rock. Rain poured down, the river flooded, a tornado came, but nothing moved the house. It was fixed to the rock. But if you just use my words in Bible studies but do not apply them to your life, you are like an unwise carpenter who built his house on a sandy beach. When a storm rolled in and the waves came, it collapsed like a house of cards. When Jesus concluded the address, the crowd burst into applause because they had never heard teaching like this. Jesus calls us to build our lives on what matters. He calls us to pay attention to our framework as we follow God's way of love. Today's story calls us to examine our foundation. But perhaps the Spirit of God also calls us to look inwardly to those hidden places that need mending. Many of us here in the sanctuary this morning have been building our faith foundations since we were small children. We have been following Jesus for as long as we can remember. We know Bible stories by heart. Jesus Loves Me is likely the very first song we learned as a young child. Lyrics to hymns of old take up portions of our heart and mind regularly. We've heard the story of the Good Samaritan so many times that often it loses its power. 
And for many of us, our foundations of faith and love were laid decades ago and were most assuredly built on something worthy and strong and lasting. But I wonder, though, if our faith framework and foundation is like the countless homes we pass by in our neighborhoods. Perhaps our spiritual foundations have settled some through the years, allowing cracks and rot to take hold. Maybe God is calling us to an inward inspection as we aim to construct lives of meaning and lives of purpose and lives of love. What repairs do we need to make? What have we neglected over time? Where have things begun to settle and crack? Are there toxic attitudes we have in need of a gut job? What upgrades do we need to make so that our inner lives reflect Jesus' call to love one another? New Testament theologian George Buttrick describes today's parable as an invitation to build our lives on love. He says this, The metaphor is apt. A person's character is like a house. Such a comparison must have been doubly appealing to Jesus. As a carpenter, he certainly worked on homes. Every thought is like a piece of timber in our house of life. Every habit is like a beam. Every imagination is like a window, well or badly placed. And they all gather into some kind of unity, seeming, seemly or grotesque, he says. One of the two builders, one is thoughtful, who deliberately plans his house with an eye to the future. The other is not a bad man, he is thoughtless and casually begins to build in the easiest way. The one is earnest, the other is content with a careless and unexamined life. I ask today, what kind of world are we building with our lives as followers of God? Like Buttrick notes, maybe we need to examine our deepest self. The parts of ourselves that are well hidden and sometimes intentionally out of sight. The parts of ourselves that we disguise because we know that deep down something is not right. Where can we make inner improvements so that we offer more kindness and less smugness? Where do we need to chip away at secretive places of prejudice so we can usher in God's vision of wholeness and equality for everyone? What spiritual repairs is the Spirit calling us to make? How can we mend our foundation so that we live from love and vulnerability and connection and peace in this world in 2021? In a recent 2020 Pew Research poll, 65% of adults in America claim Christianity as their faith. Maybe you will agree, but a brief scroll through the latest news headlines or social media helps me question this narrative. At the very least, there are cracks in the foundations and rot eating away at our beloved faith and the notion that we aim to lead lives of love. Perhaps many of you have been following the delayed 2020 Olympics the last few weeks in Tokyo. As far back as many of us can remember, the Olympic Games always served as a mark of unity and pride for our fellow American competitors. We gather around our TV and we watch with amazement as athletes push themselves to bring home the gold for their country. We root for their success and we are inspired by their life stories. And no matter what is currently happening in our world, The Olympics serves as a moment of national pride and we put aside our differences and we pull together and support and encourage and cheer for our team. I'm sure most of you read in the news that our beloved winning gymnast, Simone Biles, withdrew from the women's team competition after announcing her struggle with mental health issues. And in a statement released from the team, she writes, At this time, I need to do what's right for me and focus on my mental health. 
At the end of the day, I am human too. I have to protect my mind and my body and not just go out there and do what the world wants me to do. And in several interviews, she mentions her continued healing process from previous sexual abuse as well as her ongoing struggle with depression and anxiety. And while many Americans have rallied around her with support and compassion, as you know, many have not. And in the wake of her announcement, remarks of disdain and anger filled media platforms near and far. Reports and articles called her a quitter, a selfish sociopath, and a shame on her country. One well-known person with millions of fans says, are mental health issues now the go-to excuse for poor performance? What a joke. Just admit you're bad and you've made mistakes and you will strive to do better next time. Kids need strong role models, role models, not nonsense, someone writes. There are cracks in our foundations. We have to begin the inward journey of repairs and gut jobs and upgrades. The Spirit is calling us to form foundations built on what is true and what is honorable and what is right and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent. I don't hear a lot of this lately in our world. What are we building with our words? What are we building with our actions, with our lives? Like the theologian knows to be true, every thought is like a piece of timber in our house, every habit like a beam, every imagination like a window. Well or badly placed, they all gather, seemly or grotesque. What are we building as a church? and as Christians. Our foundations do not crack and crumble all at once. It is the little moments of neglect that build up over time. It's the racist or sexist joke told in our presence that we don't condemn. It's a momentary attitude of entitlement that motivates a selfish act. It's a judgment on another's situation without one ounce of empathy. It's a subtle act of aggression instead of vulnerability. Over time, these attitudes, they settle deep into our bones like a pervasive asbestos compromising the integrity of who we are as people of God. Chinese philosopher once said these very wise words. Watch your thoughts because they become your words. Watch your words because they become your actions. Watch your actions because they become your habits. And watch your habits because they become your character. What kind of world do we want to build as people of faith and love? Where are the cracks and the crumbling parts we need to repair? What are the gut jobs within us? What are the upgrades we need to make to reflect kindness? and authenticity, and generosity, and compassion. Our world is in desperate need of people, of faith, who builds their lives on what matters. Our world needs us to look inside and to begin the hard work of inner spiritual repair. Because like the infamous poet once said, yesterday I was clever, so I wanted to change the world. And today I'm wise, so I'm changing myself. May it be so, church family. Amen. As we leave this place today, may the road rise to meet you. May the winds be at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. May the rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may you be held in the palm of God's loving hand. Amen. Tis a gift to be simple, tis a gift to be free, tis a gift to come down where you are to be. And when we find ourselves in a place just right, twill be in the valley of love and delight. Oh, and to bend we shall.
shan't be ashamed to turn. Turn will be our delight till by turning, turning we come round, right. Tis a gift to be simple, tis a gift to be free, tis a gift to come down where you are to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, 